Muswell Castle, also known as Mouselow Castle, was probably originally an Iron Age hill fort, dating from the Middle Iron Age, 400 to 100 BC. But its origins could lie in the Bronze Age before 800 BC, and there could have been human activity on the hill even before that, going back into the Neolithic Stone Age. It's pretty obvious why it was built there. It overlooked both Glossopdale and Longendale, but could be seen for miles around and was the best defensive site in the area. It's unlikely though that there was a serious fort in the military sense. Hill forts involved a lot of digging for little protection. The ramparts may have extended for well over a mile and although there would have been a wooden palisade around the top, a large force would have been needed to keep out a determined enemy. It might have been more for show, my fort's bigger than your fort, or it could have been a sacred enclosure for religious ceremonies or high status burials at a sort of Iron Age cathedral. So there may well have been graves on the summit and maybe even from before the fort, as they were often built on sites which were already sacred. In view though of all that's happened there since, it's unlikely that there are any traces of them now. There may also have been a village on top, as at Mamtor, and there must also have been a lot of other people living nearby, as to build a structure of that size would require a very large workforce. We know of one bronze or Iron Age village site locally, and possibly another, and it's likely there were others close to the fort. It's unlikely that it was still occupied when the Romans arrived at Melandra around AD 70, as most such forts had been abandoned long before, and it would have been little use against a Roman army, so legends of two opposing forts are just fanciful. However, it's not impossible that there were people still living there. The Romans sometimes built their forts inside abandoned hill forts, but not this one. There wasn't enough level ground for their usual playing card layout, so they had to settle for the best second defensive site. After the Romans came the Anglo-Saxons, but they didn't live on fortified hilltops. However, about a thousand years after the Romans, somebody thought the summit was a prime spot for a castle. The Normans arrived in England in 1066, and within a few years had the country in an Iron Age grip. In 1135, however, there was a big falling out. Stephen of Blois and his cousin Matilda both claimed the throne. The barons took sides, or just took advantage in the period known as the Anarchy, began. They weren't allowed to build castles without a royal licence, but now they built them anyway, either to protect themselves from neighbours on the other side, or to cement their control over the populace. Our friend, who we've heard before in many of these castles being built in the area, William Peveril the Younger, custodian of the Royal Forest of the Peak, held the land on the south side of the River Evero. Ranulph, Earl of Chester, the land on the north. William supported Stephen, Ranulph supported Matilda, well, at least until he didn't. Even on the same side, though, they weren't exactly best mates, and William eventually poisoned Ranulph. William seems therefore to be the most likely builder of a castle on Mouselow, to protect the northern end of his estate from his hostile neighbour. He wouldn't have had any need for a castle there before 1135, as the local population in what was a royal, royal hunting ground was probably no more than a few dozen. It certainly wasn't built later in 1157 when the incoming Henry II, having seized William's lands, granted the manor to the abbot of Basingwork who didn't do castles. Most pop-up castles of the anarchy just had wooden palisades on top of earth ramparts and wooden buildings, but the Reverend Watson in 1775 could see signs on the summit of a strong fort surrounded by a wall. However, he thought the locals had helped themselves to most of the stone. If there were local legends of prehistoric graves within the hill fort, they would have also been grave robbers. A visitor in 1861 noted several small quarries and large heaps of stone or rubble, and the broken stone covered the whole surface. Between about 1890 and 1940 there was a much bigger commercial quarry at the West End. The castle area has suffered from vandalism and is now fenced off to protect it. It appears to have been a very rare ringwork and bailey, with a ringwork, a small oval fortification on the summit of the northeast end and a larger enclosed area, the bailey to the southwest. However, the quarrying made the existence of a bailey uncertain. So in 1994, Historic England scheduled the ringwork only as an ancient monument. Recent lard images though appear to confirm that it did extend further, probably in a Russian doll shape, although the big quarry has completely destroyed the western part.
Small excavations on the ring work in 1963 and 4 and 1984 to 1986 found a V-shaped ditch at least part of the way around. The ditch appeared to have been recut, suggesting that it may have been used for more than just a few years. However, no date was established and there was no sign of a Reverend Watson strong wall or any convincing evidence of stone buildings in the centre. There was a lot of stone rubble but that might have been spoiled from all the quarrying and stone working. A stone castle would be built of large dress blocks and even if the locals had helped themselves there would still be signs of foundations, yet they, there may therefore have been an entirely wooden structure. There are though some stones in Buxton Museum which have definitely been shaped by tools which have attracted a good deal of attention over the years and which until recently were generally assumed to have come from the hill. So in the late 1890s Lord Howard arranged for some carved stones built into a wall in Hadfield to be removed and taken to Glossop Hall. It's likely this was part of an effort to retrieve objects which had been taken from the Roman fort at Melandra, which the Glossop Antiquarian Society, led by Robert Hamnet, was then investigating. Hamnet, however, having consulted eminent authorities, concluded that the stones were very early Christian and therefore couldn't be from Melandra, as originally been supposed. There are many and varied accounts of how they got into the wall, but it all seems to go back to Hamlet, who in 1901 wrote of the stones removed from the gable end of the house at Hatfield, which were found prior to 1846 at Marslow Castle by the Reverend George Marsden. Some were later transferred to the Victoria Hall along with finds from the early Melandra excavations. Others went to Manchester Museum. In 1938, when the Melandra finds at the Vic went to Buxton Museum, the stones went with them eventually being joined by those which had gone to Manchester. They remained in store until in 1984 they were brought back to Glossop for an exhibition to coincide with the excavation of a castle on Mouse Low. When Glynis Greenman undertook the, invest the excavation of the site in 1985, she experienced a lot of warnings about working on the site, and she described these in a letter to the curator at the time as ranging from the evil of stone heads and horn figures to the possibility of ending up nailed to a tree. I do realise this sounds like a bad script for a second rate B movie in the Hammer House of Horror but fortunately most of this has happened while there were other people present so at least I can prove it really did happen. But the weird events did not stop there. Apparently when the stones were in storage before coming to the museum, they were housed with computers and other electrical items. These wouldn't work while stored with the stones and couldn't be fixed by anyone and only once the stones had left did these things return to work in order. This odd chain of events seems to have stopped when the stones came to the museum. After they returned to the museum, they were built into an arch in the new Wonders of the Peak display until it was revamped in 2017. More recent experts have thought them to be Celtic, i.e. Iron Age, and they might have been part of a shrine. The problem is though that unless either brand new or heavily weathered through long exposure, carvings can't be dated by appearance. However, the experts agreed that these carvings showed little sign of weathering. If they were ancient, they must have been long buried. The crucial bit of Hamlet's account is therefore that Marston found them whilst digging for stone, the implications being that they were well below ground. If he'd found them on the surface, they couldn't have been there since the Iron Age, or given all the activity on the hill very long at all. In advance of a revamp, the museum got them looked at again, and basically are more likely to be medieval or post-medieval, and made by a person learning to carve. There's evidence of machine working, and they may be associated with the late 18th, early 19th century Druidical movement, which was active in the Peak District, and which revived interest in Celtic culture.